<clears throat> well, I thank the Lord for the message tonight. He's um, we've been in First Kings in the teaching time, and I never thought I'd ever preach about the pillars, the porch of the temple of God. But the Lord opened my mind on this matter about these two pillars that Solomon set up at the front of his temple that he built. This is about 860 years before the birth of Christ, and it's the first erection of the temple, physical building. Before that, it was just a tent that they set up in the wilderness wanderings. Now they have a building that Solomon's been given to build that's a worship center on earth. And it's all a picture of Christ. Every single feature in the temple and around the temple and on the temple is a picture of Christ, and these two pillars, boy, they're a picture of Christ, to my surprise. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 13, I want to read the engineering specifications of the pillars to you. Uh, and King Solomon sent and fetched he, uh, Haram. Haram was a, was a really good, skilled person from Tyre. And he was a, a, a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali, Naphtali and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker of brass, and he was filled with wisdom and understanding, a cunning, and cunning to work all works in brass. And he came to King Solomon and wrought all his work. Now, what I'm about to describe to you is incomprehensible to a person that worked in the foundry for 15 years. I can't even grasp the size of these structures that this man cast in this uh, clay in this part of the world. But... For he cast two pillars of brass of 18 cubits high apiece. A cubit is the distance from your elbow to the tip of your fingers. Most men, it's 21 inches. So he cast two pillars of brass of 18 cubits high. That's 31 and a half feet <clears throat> apiece. And a line of 12 cubits did compass either of them. That means their circumference. And that's 21 feet in circumference. Pi is 3.14. That's about 6 feet and 8 inches in diameter. These are like tree trunks. These are 6 foot, 8 inches in diameter. And 40 feet tall brass. Unbelievable. And he made two chapters. That's the what's on top of the columns to support the roof and the structure that goes above them. The chapters of molten brass also to set upon the tops of the pillars. The height of, the, of one chapter was five, five cubits, that's 8.7 feet tall. And the nets of checker work, rees of chain work for the chapters, which were upon the top of the pillars. These are just decorative nets and really ornate features. Seven for the one chapter and seven for the other chapter. And he made the pillars and two rows round about upon the one network to cover the chapters that were upon the top. With pomegranates, so did he for the other chapter. A lot of decorations. And the chapters that were upon the top of the pillars were of lily work in the porch, four cubits. And the chapters upon the two pillars had pomegranates also above and over against the belly, which was by the network. And the pomegranates were 200 in rows round about upon the other chapters. A lot of fine engraving in these chapters above these huge pillars. And the and he set up the pillars in the porch of the temple. And he set up the right pillar and called the name thereof Jachin. And he set up the left pillar and called the name of it Boaz. And the definition of these names are the enlightenment that God gave that this is a picture of Christ. These pillars, this power, this might. These are 40 feet tall pillars, six and a half feet in diameter. When you come up to God's church, I think the first thing you're going to be looking at are these pillars. The door is right there behind, but the pillars are going to be amazing. Even in modern terms, we just stand there and look at these things. Ponder them. Think about them. That's what God's purpose was in these pillars, that we think and ponder upon the names, Jacob and Boaz. But before we dive into the two pillars, I want to, by way of introduction, turn you to Proverbs chapter 5. <clears throat> so I've got your mind in front of this giant temple with these giant pillars in front of it. 
And for a short time, I want to take you to the front door of the false church and what God says about it. Proverbs chapter 5 talks about the front door of the false church. My son, attend unto my wisdom, and bow thine ear to mine understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion, that, thou, that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. This is talking about the false church. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold on hell. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. You won't even know it when you're deceived by the false message of the false church. You don't, people don't know, they don't get it. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, the false church, and come not nigh to the door of her house. Don't even walk up to the front door of a false church. Lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy laborers be in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed and say, how have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. Friend, I love your soul and I don't want you to be deceived by the smooth and appealing message of the false church. Don't waste your time it said that the feet of that false church, verse 5, go down to death, and they take hold on hell. The message of the false church, it says in verse 3, the, the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. The false messenger's message is sweet to the human intellect. It's sweet, and it says it's smoother than oil. It's like a, the best salesman in the world that just soothes you and calms you down emotionally. But spiritually, you have no light and no wisdom and no understanding. This is the front door of the false church. Don't go in through that door. Don't waste your time with the message. It's there to destroy you and to deceive you and to make you feel comfortable in something that you don't even understand the end of it until you're in the end of it. I'd rather, by God's grace, you stand in front of God's holy temple and see these giant pillars, six and a half feet in diameter, one on one side that says, Jachin, that is, he shall establish. Jachin name literally means God shall establish. That's where our minds ought to be on this right pillar, seeing his power and his might in this decorated pillar with all the ornate features on the top when you look up at it and you study this pillar and you say this means he shall establish this is sure this is true this is right God's gonna establish what his covenant when I looked up the word establish the very first place in God's scriptures his holy scriptures it says Genesis chapter 6 let's just go to Genesis chapter 6 and look there Genesis chapter 6 and verse 13, God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence <coughs> through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. <clears throat> make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Very specific specifications for the ark. That's a picture of Christ also. A window shalt thou make to the ark. In a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set the side thereof with lower second and third stories. There's three stories in God's ark. Three different levels. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters. This is what God's telling Noah upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in earth shall die. And that's exactly what God did. He brought a flood. Forty days and forty nights, it covered the earth hundreds of feet above the highest point, the highest mountains. 
Nobody survived except verse 18. This is the first place where the word established comes into the God's word. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with them. What an amazing event. Thousands of years ago, God had Noah preach, warn. In the de generation when just vapors came up from the ground, there was nothing that there was no such thing as rain at that point. When Noah said, God warned me, there's going to be rain from above, so thick, everybody's going to drown. I'm building this ark. Believe me, trust in my Lord. They scoffed at him. They mocked him. His sons and wife had to live a life that our dad's the crazy one in town. Talks about things that don't exist. I bet his son's wives rejoiced the day they shut those ark doors. Said, wow, we were mocked being wives of this supposed insane man. And those floods came and it rained from above. And everybody drowned except the one that God gave the covenant to. Noah, his sons, his wife, and his son's wives. This is a picture of God the Father's elect that he put inside his dear son on the cross of Calvary. And the ways of the wrath of God the Father came all about Christ. Not to touch us, not even a drop to touch the elect that are in Christ. Everybody outside of Christ perish in their mockery of believers. Perish in their mockery of the true God. Perish in their own self-righteousness. Perish in their schemes of what the false church teaches them. To trust their own heart. Which God's word says, a man that trusts his own heart's a fool. Noah believed what God said and it rained. By God's grace, believe what this messenger now is telling you. These pillars are power. These pillars at the front of God's church this is God saying, I've established sure life for a particular people. Are you one of them? Turn to Genesis 9, verse 13. After this flood, and they came up out of the ark, and the only ones left are there. Verse 13 of Genesis chapter 9, God says, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant, of, the, of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And and I'll remember my covenant, which is between me and, and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud. And I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. God declares in the very bow in the cloud when we see a rainstorm flow over us. We see it now. God hasn't changed. His covenant's eternal. That bow is there to remind him and us Christ did away with death for those that he died for. Those that Christ died for in our place, there's no more death. There's peace evermore. Christ did away with death. He satisfied the demand of the law. The law says, if you sin but once, you deserve eternal torment. Christ said, I'll take that sin of my people on myself. I'll die their death in their place on the cross. I'll be buried the third day. I'll be resurrected and I'll make him new again. And we are bright, shining new in Christ. Is it our own works? Did we contribute to salvation? Did we repent of ourselves? Did we confess of ourselves? None of that. The false church tells man, you have to do something to earn salvation to get God's interest in you. That's a lie. Man has no ability, no consciousness to even grasp that they're lost. They'd never even cry out because they can't. They can't grasp that they're lost. Tell God, give them a new mind and cause them to see this giant pillar is amazing. He shall establish the covenant. I didn't contribute to the covenant. God established it. God ordained it. God did it. It's his work. In Hebrews 8, right here in your outline, I've printed these two next verses. He is the mediator of a better covenant, established upon better promises. He's talking about Christ is the better promise. What's the better promise? It's in Hebrews 9 or 10, 19, right there in your outline. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter in to the holiest by the blood of Jesus. When Solomon built that temple, just like in the tent of meetings, he put a little room in the back of that building. It's called the holiest of holy place. In there is the ark 
with the mercy seat on top. The blood of the lamb went there once a year until Christ came and lived and died for us. After that, Christ put his blood on that mercy seat once and forever. And for all those that he died for, the blood of Jesus is the covenant that Jachin, the huge pillar, tells us to look to. That right pillar says, look to the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the covenant of God Almighty. It's what he gave his people to save us and to keep us. Christ's blood is pure. There's nothing pure on this earth except the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You look at all the gold that they built that temple with. It's going to be amazing next Sunday when we go through the teaching time of the temple. All the ornate carvings and the gold and how pure everything was. And I know doing metallurgical work, you can look with a microscope on something that's totally pure and there's still errors in it. There's porosity, there's flaws, not in Christ's blood. There's no oxidation. There's no degradation. The pure, righteous blood of Christ is the very covenant, the very covering for sinners' sins. <clears throat> now the second pillar, Boaz, this is that defined as it is strength. The name Boaz means in it is strength. This is the very power, that pure blood I just spoke about. The pure blood of Christ is eternal life. In Hebrews 7, 16, your outline says, There ariseth another priest. There's lots of priests in the Old Testament that went in with that blood once a year. But there ariseth in our generation another priest, that's Christ, who is made not after the law of carnal commandments, but after the power of an endless life. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God the Father. He's eternal. He's endless. His blood is pure and powerful. His endless life tormented on the cross of Calvary, resurrected to show the grave couldn't even hold him. He's endless. He's all power. How can the grave hold him in there? His blood's eternal. And in his resurrection is the very hope and confidence and trust of the saint. Do we tr trust and hope in our works? No. The works we do are sick. They're pathetic. If we ever do a good work, it's because he does it in us and through us. The works we do to try to justify ourselves that's our sin. That's our iniquity. That's our false covering. Those are the things that are our problems that the false church promotes and asks you to perform to try to make you feel good before God, but it's a waste of time. It's the smooth lie and deceit of the world. In Ephesians 1 7 in your outline says, Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood. There's not redemption through the work of man, there's redemption through the work of Christ alone, his blood and righteousness alone. It's the body of Christ that has to be burned and tormented and tortured and killed and then resurrected for you. It's the only means of salvation. Turn to John chapter 6 with me. John chapter 6 <clears throat> is a place where Christ preaches about his body and blood being eaten by believers. And they thought he was insane when he was preaching this to them. Isaiah, or John chapter 6, verse 50, let's start in 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Is that every individual person? No way. Just like in Noah's time, there was the majority that were destroyed. They're made for destruction. The wicked are made for the day of evil. He's talking about his people that were in the ark, the elect of God Almighty. The Jews therefore strove among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? He's talking about cannibalism. No, he's not. Jesus expands, says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, Drink his blood. Ye have no life in you. He's saying, unless my spirit enters into your body, into your very being, I have to be eaten by you and enter into you. My spirit is what he's talking about, not his physical body. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. 
He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in them. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Christ is talking about spiritual meal. His physical body had to be tormented for you, burnt to a crisp on the cross of Calvary, tortured, heinously died in the place of sinners. And then his blood had to be shed for you, poured out onto the mercy seat and presented to the Father and accepted. These are spiritual matters that Christ is preaching about. In 59, these things said he to the synagogue that they taught in Capernaum and many there of his disciples when they heard this said, this is hard to say. We don't even get this. This doesn't make any sense to us. And Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured and said, this offends you, doesn't it? You just don't get it. He wants something to do to earn salvation. How can you eat another person's body is what you're thinking. That doesn't have anything to do with it. When Jesus knew in himself that the disciples murmured at it, he said, doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? I'm very God incarnate in human flesh. I'm God Almighty. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. You don't need to eat this flesh. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. I'm going to speak my spirit into your body. You're not going to have a choice whether you eat it and drink it. But it's going in all the way to the very heart and core of your being. And it's going to give you a new mind and a new understanding. You're going to grasp that you're a sinner and Christ alone is your righteousness. And that his blood pardons you. His blood redeems you. His blood bought you back to good stain before God the Father. And he says it's a matter of faith, matter of believing in verse 64. But there were some of you that believe not. The Spirit of God is who believes, and it's what believes inside of a saint. A saint came and take any credit for believing or trusting or resting on the blood of Christ or grasping that their sin and Christ is altogether righteousness. We don't take credit for that. We don't brag about ourselves. We yield all honor and confidence and trust in God Almighty alone. It's God that saves. Turn to Psalm 92. I skipped it earlier. I'm sorry. I don't think I've ever skipped a passage like that. <clears throat> Psalm 92, please. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. You know, only those that dwell in inside Christ and Christ dwell inside us can give true honor and praise to God. All the rest are honoring and praising themselves. And the false church says, keep it going. Act religious. Make yourself look better than you really are. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Oh, we're saved by grace and kept by grace. There's nothing we do to earn or deserve it or to keep it or maintain it. It's the mercy, sweet mercies of God that were kept in his son. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon a psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound, for thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. This is a believer, an authentic believer, that relishes, triumphs, and it has joy in the works of Christ alone. Look at verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. You know what's inside the temple? A bunch of palm trees engraved. We're going to be studying that this Sunday. The picture of those that triumph, that grow and sprout and understand and are given wisdom based on Christ residing within us. We didn't earn or deserve it. And we're just blown away when we're given it by free grace. So we don't deserve it. It shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon, super tall and super strong. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. That's the porch of the temple right there, observing these two huge pillars saying, wow, he established this covenant, this blood, and it's in his strength, the power of his blood that I've got my salvation. It's nothing of me. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. You're going to know this all your days. You'll never weary or tire of this gospel. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He's my rock 
and there is no unrighteousness in him. The purity of the Christ's blood. It's it's all over the scriptures. Now, the use of the message this evening is, is in the bottom of your outline. And it's Isaiah 17, 7. It reads, that, At that day shall a man look to his maker, the day when Christ says, You eat my flesh and drink my blood, when the Spirit of God has spoken into you. When you really grasp logically, this all makes sense now. This gospel is logical. The one that the false church teaches doesn't make a bit of difference now. That's foolishness. This is real. At that day shall a man look to his maker, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands. Neither shall he respect that which is his fingers have made. We won't look to our character. We won't look to our conduct. We won't look to the things that we did in life. We do a lot of good things. They mean nothing to God Almighty. We don't use those things to recommend ourselves before God. The very best state of man is altogether vanity. The very good effort that man attempts to do, God rejects. Perfect, pure blood of Christ is always accepted. Just like in the ark, just like in front of these two huge pillars in front of the true church. He gives power to the faint. See how little you are when you look up at these huge pillars. You little, and tiny, and faint, and unable to do anything to help yourself. That's a good place to be. He gives the power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Matt, close us in prayer, please.